Perfect. All right. Um, welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk, but if you have questions, you can unmute and ask questions or use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, um, so no classified discussion. Uh, finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. Uh, that's about it. Now let me briefly introduce our speaker today. Um, it is an honor to host Dr. Elnas uh, Rezaian, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Michigan. She received her PhD in mechanical engineering from Kansas State University in 2020 um, with her dissertation focused on stabilization of projection-based reduced total models for real time prediction of dynamics in strongly nonlinear uh, compressible flow applications. During her postdoctoral experience at the University of Michigan, she has been working with Professor Karthik uh, Durasami uh, at the Computational Aeroscience Lab on surrogate modeling and non-intrusive model reduction in complex systems using system identification and machine learning. Today, El Nas will present an exciting topic, which is uh, data-driven uh, balancing trans transformations uh, for predictive model order reduction. I'm sure uh, we will hear an exciting talk today, um, but before I pass the button, let me ask a couple of questions to Elnas um, so that we get to know her better and make this seminar somewhat informal. Um, okay, here the question goes. Um, Obviously, you are passionate about data-driven modeling in general. Is there any moment in your life when you realize that, wow, this is it? This is the field I would like to commit my career. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Choi. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the question, I should say that, um, uh, yes, I, I guess uh, when I realized the um, uh, vast application of uh, model reduction, uh, in many query applications uh, and uh, how these methods can accelerate uh, applications uh, like um, uncertainty quantification and design optimization. I was really uh, amazed by that. And I thought that um, th this, this should be the topic that I should pursue uh, in my future career. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity uh, to um, uh, be here in this seminar today and uh, talk about uh, our studies on balanced truncation. Um, so first and foremost, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the Air Force Center of Excellence on Multifidelity Modeling of uh, Rocket Combustion Dynamics, uh, which is a collaboration between five different universities on um, advancement of model reduction methods for uh, complex systems. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, in uh, today's um, presentation is mainly part of our studies on uh, modern reduction in linear systems. Uh, they ha there have been amazing uh, developments uh, in this group on other topics as well under this uh, project, including uh, basis adaptation, uh, operator inference methods, and neural network based ROMs that uh, you can uh, check out here if you are interested. And with that, um, let's get started. Um, so, as you know, reduced order modeling techniques uh, are um, uh, have, have emerged to substitute uh, high fidelity simulations in uh, many query applications uh, in which uh, we need to repetitively uh, compute the quantities of interest uh, for uh, tens of thousands of times. And so using the high fidelity uh, simulations, uh, some uh, with at least millions of degrees of freedom in these applications would be infeasible. Um, modern reduction methods uh, fall uh, under two categories, uh, intrusive and non-intrusive. Uh, intru intrusive methods um, uh, need access to the governing equations, and non-intrusive methods mainly rely on data, and they don't need access to the uh, governing equations. And now, if you're uh, familiar with modern reduction, you know that <coughs> sorry, projection-based modern reduction methods 
um, are being applied to uh, problems of increasing increasing complexity uh, these days, such as the examples that I've shown in these uh, pictures. Uh, and uh, this uh, is enabled only by making major improvements in the standard uh, projection-based model reduction framework. So let's first take a very quick look at the standard process for projection-based ROMs, uh, in which let's consider this um, set of generic equations as our high fidelity model. Uh, what we do is that uh, we first use data to uh, compute a, a low dimensional, uh, to obtain a low dimensional space uh, using a dimensionality reduction method. Uh, for example, proper orthogonal decomposition is a popular choice. Uh, and so let's say the POD modes uh, that are also called the trial uh, subspace here are represented by matrix B. And then we use a test subspace W to project the governing equations uh, onto the lower dimensional space. And in Galerkin projection, the test and trial subspaces are the same. Now, uh, there are certain limitations in this standard process, um, and uh, specifically POD Galerkin procedure that uh, prevents application of the standard process to uh, complex uh, problems like this. Um, uh, one of the limitations is that uh, POD is a linear dimensionality reduction method. So uh, if, you are, if you are dealing with strongly nonlinear uh, problems, uh, then uh, we're going to need a lot of modes to capture the true dynamics, and that defeats the purpose of model reduction. And on the other hand, uh, POD is biased towards the most energetic modes. Uh, so, for example, in control applications, uh, we are uh, mainly interested in uh, the most controllable modes rather than the most energetic modes. Uh, so, uh, POD is only suitable for these applications if uh, the most controllable modes are also the most energetic modes. We have similar uh, issues with observability as well. For example, if you're interested in capturing acoustic modes that do not contain a lot of energy, uh, then uh, these modes, uh, uh, these uh, the features will be, these waves will be uh, truncated through the standard POD uh, process. Um, and another limitation uh, with the uh, standard POD Galerkin procedure is that if the Jacobian matrix of the high fidelity model is not symmetric, which is the case in many uh, complex applications, uh, the Galerkin method does not necessarily preserve um, stability through model reduction. Um, now, there have been uh, there many methods that are developed in the uh, past years. Uh, to uh, address these limitations in the standard projection-based model reduction methods, and I believe these methods fall under these categories that I have mentioned here. Um, the first thing that we can do is to uh, move away from the linear dimensionality method and um, use a nonlinear manifold uh, uh, that, that, is, uh, that could be, for example, constructed by autoencoder neural networks, or uh, to adapt the POD bases um, in time to get a piecewise linear uh, subspace. Um, another uh, uh, set of methods uh, are uh, developed to promote symmetry in ROM equations so that uh, uh, sta uh, stability is preserved through model reduction. We also have ROM stabilization techniques and closure modeling that uh, basically improve uh, the reduced order models by modifying the ROM equations and also hyperreduction, which is outside of the scope of this talk. Um, now, for uh, specifically for linear systems, balanced truncation developed by Moore in 1981 uh, is also a projection-based model reduction method that um, uh, addresses the limitations of the standard POD Galerkin projection, uh, mainly by taking the uh, first two approaches here. Um, so let's consider a linear time invariant system as shown here in balanced truncation. We are still looking for a hierarchical modal representation, but the definition of hierarchy in balanced truncation is different from POD. So in balanced truncation, uh, instead of uh, ordering the modes from the most energetic to the least energetic, we would like, uh, as we do in POD, uh, we would like to order the modes from the most controllable and observable to the least controllable and observable. And um, in the next, uh, I guess, uh, 50 minutes, we'll see how we can do that. Um, so uh, first things first, I'll go through uh, some basic system theoretic uh, topics that we need to understand uh, balanced truncation and its data-driven version against system realization algorithm. And uh, then I will talk about, uh, so for example, external description, internal description, and system realization are the foundations for the eigen system realization algorithm. And reachability and observability and system gramians uh, are required uh, to understand the balanced truncation. Um, and after talking about these algorithms, we'll uh, see the results of applying eigen system realization algorithm to two numerical experiments, a one dimensional reacting flow problem and an error acoustic prediction problem. And uh, here I will also further introduce some additional methods uh, to uh, reduce the offline cost of construction of ROMs 
by ERA. So now what is the external description? Uh, there are two ways to describe a system, external description and internal description. External description of a system is mainly concerned with its input output behavior. So let's consider a system to be like a black box. When we look at this black box from outside, the only uh, things that we can see are the input signal that we are applying to the system and the output generated by the system in response to that input, uh, which is probably measured by some um, sensors. Um, and and uh, this is what happens in many real world applications in which we don't have access to the uh, governing equ uh, equations and we don't know what's going on inside this uh, black, black box. Uh, so external description uh, is uh, basically uh, the mapping S from the inputs U to the outputs Y. Uh, and for discrete time system, uh, it's given by this equation here that um, takes this shape in matrix form. And this uh, matrix at the, in, in the middle of the slide is actually a weighting matrix that uh, identifies how the outputs depend on the inputs at different time steps. Now, we want to see how we can obtain this mapping and also whether we can use this mapping and the external description to understand what's going on inside this uh, black box. And of course, the answer is yes. Um, so. For a linear time invariant system, uh, the, uh, each row in that weighting matrix in the external description can be described by a sequence of uh, constant uh, matrices. This sequence is also called a, a, the sequence of uh, Markov parameters. Uh, so for a linear time invariant and causal system, and by causal we mean the output at the current time step depends on the inputs at the current and the past time steps and not the future time steps. So for a, a system under these conditions, uh, this sequence of Markov parameters is given by the response of the uh, system to unit impulse. So it can be obtained in a data-driven manner. And each of these uh, blocks in this sequence are uh, P by M matrices, where P is the number of outputs and M is the number of inputs. So under these conditions, uh, the uh, um, uh, impulse response snapshots uh, of the system basically identify the input-output behavior or the external description of the system. Now, uh, uh, as I mentioned, another way to uh, describe the uh, system is through the internal description. This is also called state space representation, uh, which uh, may be uh, uh, more familiar uh, to you. And uh, for a discrete time system, the internal description is given uh, by a set of difference equations uh, that's shown here, which has this exact solution at the bottom of the uh, slide. Um, and, and so here, uh, the uh, system is no longer a black box. Um, so this, uh, besides the inputs and outputs, we also have information about the state and the governing equations. And this is the output equation here, where C is the output map that uh, identifies the, how the system interacts with the surroundings, and U is the uh, fit-through term. In the exact solution here, xk0 is the initial condition, and here b is the input map, and a is the dynamics matrix. And of course, if the system matrices are constant with respect to time, we have a linear time invariant system. Now we can uh, use this exact solution of the um, uh, state space representation to show that uh, this uh, equation at the bottom of the slide is actually the uh, impulse response of the system. Now, uh, why uh, do I mention this here? The reason is that uh, later when I, when I explain eigensystem realization algorithm, I will refer to this expression here as the impulse response or the sequence of Markov parameters. And um, uh, I'd like to, to, uh, you to see uh, why this is the sequence of Markov parameters. Uh, so simply substitute uh, unit impulse for U in the exact solution and substitute X in the output equation and um, you'll get the you know, impulse response of the system at each time step. Now, as I mentioned, the sequence of Markov parameters for a, a linear time invariant system is given by the impulse response. So if you're convinced that this is the impulse response of the system, then we can Go ahead and use uh, this expression to obtain each of the Markov parameters in this uh, sequence in terms of the system matrices. So, uh, for example, at, at the first time step, k equals zero, and the first block would be D. Then at the second time step, k equals one, the second block would be CB, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, I'd like to mention here that the system transfer function, which is actually the Laplace transform uh, of the impulse response of the system, and uh, of course the Markov parameters, uh, are invariant under coordinate transformation, which means that later in balance truncation, when we transform the system to uh, another uh, coordinates, these quantities remain unchanged. 
Uh, now, system, uh, the system realization theory is uh, the foundation uh, for uh, the data-driven version of balanced truncation that we are mainly focused on uh, in this work. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, in many engineering applications, uh, we do not have access to the governing equations, or we do have access to the equations, but we want to build a lower dimensional representation for the system. And system realization uses the external description or the input output behavior of the system to build the internal description or uh, the state space representation. So again, let's say the system is like a black box and the only information that we have is about the inputs and sensor measurements. We want to know uh, if we can use that information to identify the governing equations. Now, there, there are multiple ways to do this, but we are here specifically focused uh, on, a, uh, on taking a, uh, a system uh, a theoretic approach that resembles close connections with balanced truncation that comes with stability guarantees. And so the problem is to uh, uh, is that uh, given the external description from uh, simulations and experiments, uh, we want to identify the internal description. And uh, I'd also like to mention here that um, uh, there are infinitely many realizations for a system, uh, but we are interested um, and, and these realizations would give us the same output for uh, a specific input. But we are interested in the realization that, that can uh, do this task with the minimum number of degrees of freedom, and that's called the minimum realization. And the Eigen system realization algorithm is a way to construct this minimum realization. Uh, so the Eigen system realization algorithm mainly uh, relies uh, on a matrix that is called Hankel matrix, uh, this matrix that's shown here. If you uh, assemble a matrix by uh, 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 with uh, the impulse response or the sequence of Markov parameters uh, as its rows, then uh, this matrix is called the Hankel matrix, and uh, it uh, plays a key role in model re reduction of linear systems, as we will see. Uh, so only uh, two topics are left here, the reachability and observability, um, and also the system gramians um, before we can uh, talk about balanced truncation. Now, what is reachability? Uh, uh, yeah, what is reachability? A system is reachable if all of its states can be uh, excited by the control action, or in other words, uh, if the uh, impact of the control signal uh, can reach all of the states in the system, then that system is reachable. And for a linear time invariant system, Reachability reduces uh, to an algebraic definition uh, that's um, basically identified by this matrix here, which is called the reachability matrix. An LTI system is reachable if and only if uh, the rank of this matrix is equal to the order of the system N. Uh, and observability, on the other hand, determines whether um, the, all of the states in the system are accessible through the output. For example, if the output of the system remains unchanged, uh, with respect to variations in one of the state variables, then uh, uh, the system is not observable. And, and also observability is identified by this matrix that's shown here, which is the observability matrix. And um, uh, the system is observable if and only if uh, this matrix is full rank. Hey, Elnaz, so small n here um, was the size of the state? Uh, yes, and n is the size of the state. It's the okay. number of degrees of freedom. Right. Okay, thank you. Sure. So now we can uh, go ahead and define the uh, system gramians. For a stable continuous time system, the reachability gramian is, uh, is shown by this equation, and it's actually the solution of this Lyapunov equation. For discrete time systems, this reachability gramian can be computed using the reachability matrix. Um, and uh, uh, the system gramians are Hermitian matrix, matrices, and they have uh, real eigenvalues, uh, which means that if we uh, apply eigenvalue decomposition to the reachability gramian, its uh, largest eigenvalues correspond to the uh, directions uh, that are the most reachable in the system or the states that can be affected by the um, uh, smallest amount of actuation energy. Now, keep that in mind. I'll come back to this point in a few seconds. Uh, similarly, for a stable continuous time system, the observability uh, gramian is given by this equation, and it's the solution to another Lyapunov equation. Uh, for discrete time systems, this gramian can be computed uh, using the observability matrix. Uh, the observability gramian is also a Her Hermitian matrix, and its largest eigenvalues 
correspond to the most uh, observable directions. And now remember that at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that uh, in balanced truncation, we are looking for a modal representation uh, that uh, basically orders the modes from the most controllable and uh, most uh, observable to the least controllable uh, and observable. Um, the system gramians, the reachability and observability gramians, identifies how reachable and observable each state in the system is. And therefore, we can directly use these gramians to identify that modal representation for balanced truncation. Um, and uh, another point here is that uh, instead of um, uh, solving these Lyapunov equations to obtain the um, system gramians, we can also obtain these gramians by, um, by a data-driven approach. So uh, the reachability gramian can be computed by uh, the impulse response of the direct system, and the observability gramian can be computed by the impulse response of the adjoint system, and these are called the empirical gramians. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, that we've covered all the, um, the theory that we needed uh, to lay the foundation for balanced truncation and eigen system realization algorithm. And at this point, we can um, jump into these exciting topics. So for an um, LTI system uh, that's shown here, which represents our high fidelity model, uh, in balanced truncation, we are looking for a transformation matrix T that uh, makes the reachability and observability gramians equal and diagonal, or in other words, balanced. Uh, so WP is here the reachability gramian, WO is the observability gramian, and sigma is the is a um, diagonal matrix. Now, why do we want to uh, balance the gramians? The reason is that we want to give equal weight to the controllability and observability such that the states that are difficult to reach are also difficult to observe, and we can get rid of them because uh, these states um, need a lot of actuation energy to be affected, and even if they are affected, uh, the output of the system is very sensitive with respect to their variations, so we can just uh, uh, remove those uh, states uh, from the system. And so, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, reachability and observability gramians are uh, the key components of uh, balanced truncation. So the first thing that we do here is to compute these gramians by solving the Lyapunov equations. Um, and uh, right up front, you can see that uh, this method can only be applied to stable systems because these gramians are only defined for a stable system. Um, uh, they're not defined for unstable systems. Uh, and so in order to compute the transformation matrix that balances the gramians, uh, we compute the Cholesky factors of the gramians uh, and then SPD of the product, product of the Cholesky factors. And from there, we can compute the uh, balancing modes and the inverse balancing modes that are uh, at the end used along with the full order model matrices A, B, and C to construct the ROM matrices. So the transformation matrix T is actually um, a, a matrix that transforms the uh, system uh, to coordinates in which the most controllable modes are also the most observable modes. And in this uh, stage, where we compute SPD of the product of the Cholesky factors, uh, we actually truncate the singular vectors corresponding to the smallest singular values, uh, because uh, these singular vectors represent the least controllable and the least uh, observable directions. Um, and as you can see, in, in order to compute the uh, ROM matrices, we are directly using the full order model matrices. So the method is intrusive. Uh, for balanced truncation, we need to have access to the ROM matrices. Um, a powerful aspect of balanced ROMs is that uh, they satisfy these error bounds that I've shown here, where G is the transfer function of full order model, and GR is the transfer function of the ROM. Um, and so the ROM error is upper bounded by the sum of the truncated singular values. Now, although balanced ROMs uh, satisfy theoretical error bounds, but there are certain limitations that uh, prevent their application uh, to more complex problems. Um, uh, we've already talked about some of these uh, limitations. Um, and at the bottom here, I have some methods uh, that address uh, each of these uh, limitations and challenges. And on the right, uh, I have a, a list of a few sample uh, references that uh, you can look at uh, if you are interested uh, in any of these scenarios. Like, for example, if the system is unstable, 
if there are uh, a few unstable nodes in the system that you want to uh, uh, preserve through model reduction for some control purpose, uh, then the uh, original balanced truncation method cannot be used. Uh, and so uh, under these conditions, we can, for example, decompose the system into stable and unstable subsystems. We can use empirical gramians or a partially data-driven version of balanced truncation, which is uh, called the approximate balanced truncation, although these two require adjoint simulations. So if you don't have access to the adjoint system, you can't use these methods. And finally, the Eigen system realization algorithm, that's the uh, purely data-driven version of BT. And if the system is uh, extremely stiff, then uh, the Cholesky factors in the analytical balance truncation method uh, would be affected, can be affected by numerical errors and the balance runs can be uh, inaccurate. And uh, in that case, we would um, resort to the uh, data-driven versions of, the, uh, of balance truncation. Also, if the dimension of the system is uh, more than a few thousands, uh, then um, computing the Gramians with the standard method by solving the Lyapunov equations would become expensive and we should uh, go with methods two to five. And lastly, if we don't have access to the internal description or the governing equations, uh, or uh, if you want to build a ROM based on the data that comes from experiments, then uh, Eigen system realization algorithm is pretty much the only method that we can use here. So as you can see, ERA is a very versatile method uh, that uh, basically addresses um, at least all of the limitations that I have mentioned uh, here. Uh, but uh, there is no free lunch. Uh, like any other data-driven method, uh, the performance of ERA ROMs uh, depends on the training data that we use for them. So um, ERA ROMs do not necessarily satisfy the theoretical error bounds given by, uh, by the analytical balance truncation. And, um, uh, and that's why we should be very careful about the sampling properties when we want to collect training data uh, for the ERA ROMs. So now the Eigen system realization algorithm is originally a system identification method uh, that uh, uses the uh, external description of the system to build a minimum realization uh, for the uh, for the system, uh, and it has strong uh, connections with uh, uh, balanced truncation method, which is why it's considered a non-intrusive data-driven version of balanced truncation. So considering this uh, discrete time system, which is our full order model, then we have the Hankel matrix here uh, that we have already seen before. Uh, and YI is the sequence of Markov parameters or the uh, impulse response of the uh, system. And each subsequent uh, row in this Hankel matrix is constructed by uh, shifting the uh, impulse response one step forward in time. And despite I've... Uh, mm, uh, written this uh, sequence of Markov parameters in terms of the system matrices, but note that this is a, a completely data-driven process and we don't need access to the uh, uh, full order model matrices at all. So the next thing that we do is to compute another matrix, uh, which is called the shifted Hankel matrix. And this uh, matrix is obtained by uh, shifting the entire Hankel matrix one step forward in time. Now, this may remind people of dynamic mode decomposition. Uh, we'll talk about the connections of ERA with DMD in the next slide. Um, so then we use the uh, shifted Hankel matrix along with the singular values and singular vectors of the Hankel matrix to build the ROM matrices. And as you can see, there are no ABC matrices in these equations uh, because the method is non-intrusive and we don't need access to the uh, full order model matrices or any adjoint sim simulations unlike the approximate um, balanced truncation method. And therefore, uh, even if the data comes from experiments, we can still use this method. Now, for those of you who are familiar with dynamic mode decomposition, it's shown in this paper that ERA is directly related to DMD. Uh, so if we apply DMD to H and H prime instead of the usual snapshots matrices, A tilde is here, uh, the linear operator given by DMD. Uh, and if we compare this uh, linear operator against the dynamics matrix given by ERA, we can see that the two matrices are related with a similarity transform. Uh, so their eigenvalues are the same and their eigenvectors uh, are related. So we can as well use ERA to compute the DMD modes. Okay, um, so now I guess we can um, uh, see some results of uh, application of the Eigen System Realization algorithm uh, to our two numerical experiments and also uh, talk about some uh, practical aspects of, um, of ERA. 
So the first uh, example that we are, uh, we are going to look at is a one-dimensional reacting flow uh, problem that's governed by the one-dimensional Navier-Stokes equations with uh, species transport and reaction that are shown here. Uh, we solve these equations with a finite volume approach using the second order row scheme and dual time, sp time stepping. And in order to solve these equations, we have used an open source code uh, that's developed in our group. Uh, this uh, framework is called PERFORM, which stands for Prototyping Environment for Reacting Flow Order Reduction Methods. And uh, it's basically a package that uh, provides uh, uh, multiple uh, benchmark problems, including one dimensional reacting flow uh, problems that can be used uh, to test model reduction techniques. And uh, it also comes with multiple uh, model reduction uh, capabilities, including uh, different projection-based model reduction methods with hyper-reduction and linear and nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods. So the code is available in this uh, GitHub repo, along with the complete uh, documentation and the capabilities of the uh, full order model and the ROM in the code. So we solved the nonlinear full order model subject to characteristic boundary conditions, and this table um, shows some of the specifics. Uh, and and uh, we obtained a steady state solution that's shown here in these plots, which represents a standing flame in, at the vicinity of the uh, domain. So this is pressure, this is velocity, this is temperature, and this is species mass fraction. And then we linearize the uh, equations about this steady state solution to get a, a linear set of equations that we then use to uh, build the ERA ROMs. So this is our uh, linear full order model here, where J is the Jacobian matrix evaluated at the steady state solution, and Q is the vector of uh, primitive variables, and B contains the boundary fluxes. U is our input. Uh, this plot here shows the eigenvalues of the full order model. All of the eigenvalues are uh, in the left side of the uh, complex plane, uh, and, and so the system is stable. Now, what's challenging about this uh, application is the uh, extreme stiffness uh, of the uh, system due to the presence of a chemical source term. So the uh, condition number of the Jacobian matrix is in the order of 10 to 13, uh, which, as I said, uh, it will introduce uh, numerical errors in the Cholesky factors in the uh, analytical balance truncation, and that's why uh, we resorted to the data-driven version of uh, balance truncation here. So uh, we uh, trained the ERA ROMs uh, by, uh, 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 by applying unit impulse to the system. We are applying unit impulse uh, to the back pressure through the uh, characteristic boundary conditions at the downstream uh, of the domain, uh, and uh, we collect the snapshots. These plots show the norm of the state for pressure, velocity, temperature, and species mass fraction. And as you can see, uh, this system has a lightly damped impulse response, which means that uh, there is a uh, there's an eigenvector in the system that takes a long time to uh, die out. And uh, that makes construction of ERA ROMs uh, more complex because uh, we need to capture enough samples to, we need to collect enough samples to capture the decay of this eigenvector, and that results in a larger uh, Hankel matrix and, uh, that is uh, harder to uh, work with. So we do that, and then uh, this uh, plot here shows the uh, singular values, uh, the decay of the singular values of the Hankel matrix. Uh, 77 pressure and velocity modes, uh, 50 temperature and 19 mass fraction modes capture 99.99% of the input-output energy. Um, so we construct the ROMs, and this plot here shows the eigenvalues of the ROM. Um, all of them are stable, but uh, note that the time step of the ERA ROM is two orders of magnitude larger than the time step of the full order model. So if we run the full order model with the same time step as the ROM, it will be unstable, which is what these uh, red circles are show. And on the right, uh, we are comparing the reconstruction of the impulse response by the ROM against the full order model, which shows perfect match. But we are more interested in the predictive performance of ROMs because at the end of the day, that's the ultimate goal of model reduction. So um, uh, we have trained the ROMs uh, with uh, unit impulse, and we are here testing it with a completely different input, which is the sinusoidal input with a frequency of 215 kilohertz. Uh, so ignoring these discrepancies at the right side for a few seconds, we can see that in the uh, rest of the domain, uh, the ROM solution perfectly matches the full order model. Now, why do we have these discrepancies here? 
let's look at uh, these uh, plots on the left, which show the impulse response at an early time step. As you can see, as the uh, impulse enters the domain from the right side, uh, there are very sharp gradients close to the uh, right boundary that attenuate as the impulse uh, propagates in the domain. And uh, apparently, uh, the sampling frequency uh, that we used during collection of training data for the uh, ERA ROMs was not uh, sufficient to capture these uh, uh, sharp gradients. And that's why these discrepancies appear uh, at the right side of the domain through prediction. Uh, but um, uh, this is challenging because, uh, as, as I mentioned, the system already has a likely damped impulse response, so we needed to uh, capture a lot of, um, uh, collect a lot of snapshots to capture that. And um, we cannot afford uh, to further increase the uh, sampling frequency in the entire domain uh, to capture those sharp gradients. And that's why we came up with a, a simple output domain decomposition method to resolve these gradients without the need to uh, increase the sampling uh, frequency in the entire domain. I I'll talk about that later, but before that, uh, we did some tests uh, to compare the ERA ROMs against the uh, projection-based ROMs, specifically the purity Galerkin ROM in this slide, where the POD modes are trained with the same impulse response snapshots as the ERA ROMs, and then um, the ROM is uh, being tested with the same sinusoidal input that I talked about in the previous slide. So these uh, plots here show uh, the probe measurements for a probe located at the vicinity of the flame. The black line is the ROM, and the red line is the full order model, and as you can see, the ROM is not doing a good job at all in prediction. And this uh, encouraged us to further compare uh, ERA against uh, least squares petrov galerkin as well. Uh, so here the projection-based ROMs are trained with um, combined snapshots uh, with perturbations with frequencies of 200, 210, and 220 kilohertz, and then tested with, uh, with, a, uh, with an intermediate frequency of 215 kilohertz. And these plots show the relative error computed based on the full order model solution Q and the ROM solution Q hat. So as you can see, the black line shows the ERA ROM, which is the best, and the blue line is the POD Galerkin ROM, and these three uh, lines are for the least squares Petrov Galerkin. We have multiple lines because LSPG is uh, sensitive with respect to time step, and we wanted to try different time steps. So as you can see, none of these uh, uh, projection-based ROMs are able to compete against ERA uh, for this linear system. And so let's uh, return again uh, to the uh, problem that we had at the right side of the uh, boundary with the um, uh, sharp gradients. Um, so I said that uh, we didn't want to increase the sampling frequency in the entire domain because that would give us a huge Hankel matrix that's hard to work with. Uh, so we uh, use this uh, output domain decomposition idea. So consider the uh, discrete time full order model here. The idea is to decompose the output uh, matrix, output map, output matrix C uh, into three blocks, where each block is used by a different ROM separately. That's why we have ROM 1, ROM 2, and ROM 3. So each of these ROMs is trained uh, with uh, impulse response snapshots collected with a different sampling frequency. Uh, ROM1, that has the uh, lowest sampling frequency, covers the majority of the computational domain, and ROM3, that has the highest sampling frequency, uh, covers only the um, uh, five um, uh, rightmost cells of the domain. That's where we had the sharpest gradients. Um, and so although ROM3 uh, has many more Markov parameters compared to ROM1, but the number of rows in the Hankel matrix of uh, ROM3 is one order smaller than ROM1. Um, and so uh, we are basically from uh, moving from the left side of the domain to the right side of the domain. We are increasing the sampling frequency while maintaining computational efficiency as much as we can. And then we use another method uh, to further reduce the size of the Hankel matrix. This is called tangential interpolation, uh, which is developed for multi-input, multi-output systems to reduce the uh, number of inputs and outputs before construction of the Hankel matrix. So what we do is that we first assemble the impulse response in two different ways, uh, as can be seen in theta L and theta R. Then we apply SVD to each of these two matrices separately. Uh, and the singular vectors of theta L uh, are the uh, left tangential modes W1 that represent the um, low dimensional output space. And uh, the singular vectors of theta R 
uh, are the uh, right, uh, right tangential modes of W2 that represent the uh, low dimensional input space. And so what we do is that we go ahead and uh, project the impulse response onto these um, input and output subspaces to get Y hat and we use Y hat instead to construct the Hankel matrix. And we follow the same standard procedure for construction of ERA ROMs. But at the end, we're gonna need to uh, lift the um, ERA ROM matrices back to the original high dimensional input output space. So we use these methods uh, in our application and this table shows the uh, offline cost uh, of um, ERA ROMs with and without tangential interpolation. As, uh, as you can see, the tangential interpolation method has reduced the offline cost by a factor of around uh, 1.7. And uh, in the uh, online phase, uh, the online wall clock time of the ERA ROM is uh, 0 0.116, and, uh, which, which basically gives us two orders of magnitude reduction in computation time compared to the full order model, and at the bottom we have the ROM predictions uh, for this case where there, there is no trace of those discrepancies at the right side of the uh, domain anymore. So next we uh, decided to uh, apply ERA uh, to a um, slightly more complex problem. Uh, the goal here is to uh, use ERA ROMs to predict aeroacoustic response of an airport. Uh, so for this example, we have a subsonic flow, a Mach 0.5 flow over an uh, airfoil, and we are perturbing the entire far field boundary uh, to model atmospheric turbulence. And then uh, we are aiming to predict the uh, acoustic response of the airfoil as the uh, perturbations propagate and uh, interact in the domain. Uh, so uh, to that end, we first uh, run the full order, uh, the high-fidelity simulations, uh, which are based on the two-dimensional uh, Euler equations here. Uh, we use a finite volume approach uh, with a second order row scheme to solve the equation subject to characteristic boundary conditions. Uh, so we generate a steady state solution and then we uh, project the equations, uh, we uh, linearize the equations about that steady state solution to get a, a linear set of equations here that's used to build the ERA ROMs. Here J is the Jacobian matrix and Q prime is the perturbation field. Now I'd like to mention a few practical points about application of ERA in this uh, example and, and also in general. Um, so although theoretically uh, we uh, uh, train ERA ROMs uh, by the response of the system to unit impulse, but in practice, depending on your application, a unit impulse may not even be physical or it may not be um, effective. For example, in this application, we have a subsonic flow uh, and so a unit impulse would mean that we need to set Mach number uh, along the uh, far field boundary to one, which uh, is not even consistent with our uh, problem setup. And um, on the other hand, we realize that in this application, applying an impulsive input in a single time step uh, is not uh, effective. And we need to apply that input um, uh, for a longer time uh, to actually affect, uh, affect the system. Uh, and so that's why we decided to perturb the uh, velocity along uh, the entire far field boundary with a Gaussian shaped input. And uh, another point is that, as I mentioned, we need to uh, perturb the entire far field boundary in this case. Uh, uh, so we have a multi input, multi output system, which means that we need to perturb each cell um, along the far field boundary to collect a separate uh, sequence of Markov parameters. Um, and uh, assemble all of those uh, Markov parameters in one Hankel matrix and proceed there uh, and uh, proceed to construction of ERA ROMs from there. Um, uh, so, for example, if we have a 400 by 100 grid, we're going to have 604 uh, cells or input channels along the far field boundary for this application. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to perturb each of those channels or each of those uh, 604 channels separately to collect the training data, uh, which is apparently uh, very expensive. Uh, so as the grid becomes finer, uh, the number of uh, cells along the uh, far field boundary increases and the offline cost of construction of ERA ROMs uh, becomes uh, prohibitive. And that's why we uh, came up with an idea based on uh, the Gaffey POD approach uh, to basically uh, reduce the number of uh, input channels along the far, far field boundary uh, and, and therefore the offline cost of construction of uh, ERA ROMs. Uh, we did so many tests, so you can find the results in this paper, but in the interest of time, uh, I just uh, directly jump into the GAPI POD idea. Uh, 
So Gabby POD is a method that is usually used for um, sparse sensing and uh, construction of entire flow fields from sparse sensor measurements and also for uh, hyper reduction in reduced order models. Um, uh, and uh, the um, general procedure for GAPI POD is that we first uh, compute a set of modes, for example, POD modes uh, based on um, a set of training data uh, that uh, are collected in matrix Q here. So Q can be approximated by linear combination of POD modes by, and, and A is here, the uh, modal coefficients. Um, S is an observation matrix that uh, basically contains uh, our um, uh, sparse sensor measurements. And P is a uh, permutation matrix that um, uh, uh, basically identifies the, the elements, chooses the elements of Q and phi that correspond to the sensor locations. And the goal here is to reconstruct the entire flow field from uh, the sparse sensor measurements. Now, the question is, um, how do we know where should we locate those um, uh, sensors in order to get maximum reconstruction accuracy? And that, that question is answered in this paper and also some earlier works. Um, and uh, it's shown in this paper that the optimal uh, location of the sensors uh, is given uh, by the um, uh, pivot locations when we apply QR factorization with column pivoting uh, to the uh, matrix of POD modes. And this is for the case where the uh, desired number of sensors is equal to the uh, number of retained modes. And for the oversample case, we should apply QR factorization to phi phi transpose. And so having the uh, optimal sensor locations and the sensor measurements in S and also the POD modes, then we can solve an inverse problem to obtain the uh, modal coefficients. And from there, we can reconstruct the uh, flow field. And, and so we have um, basically adapted this uh, algorithm for actuator selection. And in our case, uh, our goal is basically to use this algorithm to identify the most critical input channels along the far field boundary for training the ERA runs. Uh, so the general procedure is very similar to the standard method, uh, but our training data is different. Uh, our training data is uh, basically the Markov sequences corresponding to all of the input channels that are computed using the course, a course grid. Uh, so the whole idea here is to avoid running the uh, full order model in the high resolution grid uh, to obtain uh, the Markov sequences for all of the input channels. So we instead run the full order model in a coarser grid and collect the training data for GAPI POD. And this table compares the dimensions of uh, these matrices in our implementation of the method against the standard GAPI POD method. And so Q the, uh, that contains our uh, training data here is P by M, where P is the total number of actuators and M is the number of snapshots. Uh, S the observation matrix is P, which uh, is actually not the observation matrix, but uh, P S by M, uh, where P S is the desired number of actuators and uh, P is the permutation matrix, it's P S by P and um, A hat is similar to the standard uh, approach. So then we take, um, uh, this um, uh, algorithm and uh, reconstruct the uh, Markov sequence. Although note that uh, uh, we are not using the reconstruction of Markov sequence by GAPI POD at all. Here, the only thing that we need from this algorithm is the location of the most critical input channels along the far field boundary uh, that uh, we want to use in order to train, in, in order to uh, perturb only those channels in the uh, full order model that is run in the final grid. Uh, so we use this method for our 400 by 100 grid, where uh, we have a total of 604 input channels along the far field boundary. And uh, GAPI POD gives uh, the optimal location for 150 input channels uh, that uh, we only uh, perturb those channels to collect Markov sequences to train the ERA ROMs. And then we also use a tangential interpolation to further reduce the size of the Hankel matrix. And this table shows the uh, number of retained left and right tangential modes and also their own dimension. Um, note that the left modes uh, represent a reduction from 40,000 uh, output channels and the right modes represent a reduction from 100 and originally 600, uh, 150 and originally 604 uh, input channels. So uh, that reduction is major. Uh, and the left plot here shows uh, the decay of singular values uh, of the Hankel matrix and the right plot shows the eigenvalues of the ERA ROMs that are stable. 
So now we'd like to um, evaluate the predictive performance of the ROMs by um, trying different types of inputs that are not seen during the training. So we, ha we have trained the ERA ROMs by the Gaussian shaped input, and uh, here we are using the sinusoidal input and in, uh, perturbing uh, velocity uh, along um, at uh, all 604 channels along the far field boundary simultaneously. And these plots here show the probe measurements for a probe that is located at the bottom of the airfoil. Uh, so, uh, besides some discrepancies in the amplitude of the V component of velocity, we can see that the uh, ROM um, agrees uh, very well with the full order model. And this is also shown in, these, uh, in this snapshot of the pressure perturbation contour, uh, where the left one is the full order model and the right one is the uh, ROM. So, we decided to test uh, uh, a more complex uh, input signal, which is this triangle wave with sharp gradients. And, um, uh, looking at the probe measurements, uh, there are some discrepancies in the U component of velocity, but overall the ROMs are uh, correctly picking up the dynamics uh, in response to uh, a more challenging input channel as well. And the last input signal that we tried uh, was a, a non-periodic step input that we applied to the entire far field boundary, all uh, 604 channels, not only uh, the channels identified by GAPI POD. And uh, again, we can still see that the ROM uh, is replicating the uh, dynamic, dynamics of the full order model very well. Uh, so that's for the accuracy uh, of the reduced order models regarding uh, computational savings. This table gives us some information about the online and offline computational savings, the linear, linearization of the full order model uh, gave us an uh, order of magnitude reduction uh, in uh, computation time for each Markov sequence. The low fidelity GAPI POD approach reduced the number of input channels by a factor of four, and therefore the computation time of the training data by uh, 353 hours. And unfortunately, we were not able to uh, compute uh, an, uh, online, an offline speed up factor because uh, without the GAPI POD method, uh, constructing the ERA ROMs was uh, beyond our computational resources. And at the, in the online phase, uh, the ERA ROM gave us a speed up factor of uh, 258. And so uh, we went through a long journey in the past uh, 15 minutes, almost 15 minutes. Uh, the takeaway message, messages are that um, Eigen System Realization Algorithm uh, is a non-intrusive data-driven version of balanced truncation that addresses uh, many of the limitations of this method in application to more complex problems. Although the downside is that, uh, like any other data-driven method, the performance of ERA ROMs depends on the training data, and so we should be careful about the sampling properties to train ERA ROMs, but if, if trained properly, ERA ROMs uh, can operate in a, a purely predicting, uh, predictive uh, scenario. Uh, and uh, looking at the applications, uh, we also said that um, sampling the impulse response sufficiently could be challenging uh, because uh, it may increase the offline cost of uh, construction of ERA ROMs, for example, when the uh, system has a lively damped impulse response or sharp gradients that need uh, higher sampling frequencies and also in systems with many inputs and uh, input and output channels, also uh, the cost of ERA uh, increases. And then we uh, uh, introduced some additional methods to reduce the offline cost, like the tangential interpolation method, uh, domain decomposition approach, and also a low fidelity uh, version of the GAPI POD method for actuator selection. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the uh, uh, topics that could be uh, pursued further um, as, as uh, future work would be, for example, application of ERA to larger scale problems and coming up with uh, ideas to further decrease the offline cost of ERA ROMs and also improving upon the existing algorithms for ERA in time varying and uh, nonlinear systems, uh, which is also something that uh, we are currently working on. And with that, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, very informal talk. And I learned a lot about the balance truncation. Ah, great. Uh, yes, let's ha let's have a Q&A session. <clears throat> um, I can start. Um, I have a clarification question. If you go to slide 35, if you don't mind. Um, 35. Yeah. And uh, you compare the LSPG and Galakin. Okay. POD. There, um, you apply the LSPG and Galakin to linearized right. full order model. Yes, that's correct. Yes. 
<clears throat> okay, because they can be applied to nonlinear. Yes, uh, of course. Yeah, well, but directly. we wanted them to be consistent with the ERA round, so we applied them to the uh, linearized full order model here. I see. So, and and when the conclusion, like the story you you're telling in this slide, is when it is, when it is applied to the linear uh, problem, ELA can outperform in in terms of accuracy, both LSPG and uh, color QD. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, since ERA is basically the data driven version of balanced truncation, it's, it's able to uh, perform in a purely predictive setting where the uh, input signal is not uh, seen uh, during the train in the training data, uh, while the uh, projection based ROMs are not able to perform as well as ERA in, in such a uh, truly predictive setting without uh, having observed that uh, perturbation. Um. Well, <clears throat> there are there are ways of parameterizing the Galakin POD and LSPG. I'm not sure you have applied those. Techniques. No, no, we are here using the standard projection based model reduction methods. So we are basically comparing ERA to the standard uh, methods. Okay, not, not the variant, yes. uh, like the parametric. Well, all right. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question um, in chat room. Kevin asked, Okay, he has a few questions for future milestones. First, <clears throat> what would your approach be toward unsteady nonlinear problem? And second question is, how can it be extended toward a more generic input than a linear actuator? So he basically has a two questions. Right. Um, so for linear problems, um... For nonlinear problems, and I mean uh, that's the million dollar question. Although there have been some efforts, uh, like for example, for weakly nonlinear problems, uh, some people directly apply uh, the uh, same balanced truncation algorithm, um, and also there have been uh, some recent efforts using um, uh, uh, again uh, methods that uh, stem from the approximate balanced truncation, mainly uh, using covariance balancing, for example. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, haven't seen any uh, methods that apply uh, ERA uh, ROMs to uh, nonlinear problems. It has been uh, in the uh, same direction as uh, approximate balanced truncation, but not the eigensystem realization algorithm because uh, they are different. Uh, you know, because approximate balanced truncation uh, is kind of partially data driven. We still need access to the full order model operators and uh, adjoint system simulations, but balanced truncation is. Uh, but uh, ERA is purely data driven. And the what, Kevin's second is, question was how can it be extended for the more generic input than a linear actuator? Uh, well, at least for the problems that uh, we have considered here, um, any type of input that we have used uh, works uh, on these problems. Um, so I think uh, if the ROMs are trained properly, any type of input that you use uh, would be um, would result in accurate ROMs. Thank you, uh, and that's. Um, I have another question about the gap POD that that you introduced. And I don't know if it's a slide forty two, forty three, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> when I heard that. First, I thought you you use the gap POD um, to reduce the parameter dimensionality because the as you you know refine the mesh on the boundary, uh, the number of parameter increases you know crazy and the high dimensional parameter space it's 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 really hard to um, deal with in da data driven approach in general. So you try to use the dimensionality of the parameter space on, on gap using gap POD. That that was what I my, my understanding, but up to in this slide you're you're doing something different. I mean, you you apply <clears throat> you run the um, the simulation in coarser grid, and then yes, that's right. Uh, yes, so we are uh, running the simulations and uh, over the coarser grid to collect the training data for gap POD, and then uh, we are uh, using the optimal. Uh, actuator locations given by the uh, pivot soft uh, QR factorization with uh, column pivoting in gap POD to identify the most critical input channels, which means the input channels that affect the uh, Markov sequence uh, the most. Uh, uh, okay, um, great. And I guess my understanding was 
some are correct then um how many how many you know indices do you extract um uh, get ppod is yeah so we are um um, um so PS here is the desired number of uh, actuator locations. We have considered 150 uh, input channels. So we are reducing from uh, the uh, original 604 input channels uh, to 150 input channels. I see. Okay. So that that definitely helps on the. Um... Yes. Uh, so as, as I said, uh, this uh, basically reduces the uh, cost of uh, construction uh, generation of the training data by uh, 353 hours. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions from audience? You can unmute yourself and ask questions. Don't be shy. Um, well, if not, let's thank our speaker today, uh, Elnas, uh, for the wonderful talk. And and it, it was a very informal talk, and I learned a lot um, from you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Choi, and everyone else. Great speaker. Um, well, that um, you know, concludes the today's seminar. Uh, let's thank our, our speaker, uh, Elnas, um, one more time. And um, I think the next DDPS seminar is Tuesday next week, um, which will be a hybrid. Uh, so if you are on site, then you can actually come in person. So um, hope to see you there. Um, all right. Thank you. Have a nice. Thanks.